for problem number one in the area of volumes, the correct answer problem number one was C. I think problem number one was C. It was volume of right minus left. So your integral bound was zero to three of pi square root x. We have nine pi. Number two, my answer was also C. So in number two, this was also a right minus left with respect to X. So your area of your integral was equal to zero to two of E to the X over two DX. And then you antiderived that, and when you took the antiderivative of that, it was like an e to the u problem. So you had to say that u was equal to x over 2. So du was equal to 1 half dx. And if your answer was off by that fraction of 2, that's y. So what happened is if you were missing that 2 on print, you had b because you forgot that the antiderivative of e to the x over 2 is really 2 du e dx. So that 2 comes out in front, and that's why it is c and not e. Problem number three, the answer to number three is going to come from the fact that you're bounding your region between those two points. So you have to, again, if you think about the drawing or the imaginary lines, this is going to be a top minus bottom problem because it is the x-axis and the curve y equals cosine x. So again, y equals cosine x, x axis, and then you have x equals negative pi over 2. Well, negative pi over 2 is really 3 pi over 2, which is really still just here. And then you go over to pi x. which on cosine is also zero. So your curve for chi, chi abs, day of chi abs, to chi abs, will go from zero to zero, and then this peak here would be at zero. So that says that the area of the region from negative chi abs less than or equal to x less than or equal to k is three times the area of the region from k to pi halves, then what must k equal? So what I would have done was integrate the area from negative pi halves to k. Of cosine x to x. And then I would have also integrated the area from k and it says that the area for the region from negative pi halves to k is three times the area of the region from one to one. Once I had those areas, which would be um, Antiderivative of cosine, which is negative sine.
sign of negative chaos would be a negative one. Sine of pi halves would be a positive one. So we get one minus sine k equals sine k plus one. That minus the minus. And then we know that the lower half has equal three times the upper half. So I would have multiplied this part by three. So that sine of k plus one equals three minus three sine k. So that they would be equivalent. Because if you multiply the lower half by three, you'll make it equal to the upper half. And then you just need to solve this side. So you would subtract one. So you get 2, add 3k, so you get 4, so you have 4 sine k equals 2, so then you have sine k equals a half. So then when does the inverse sine equal 1 half? So inverse sine of 1 half is going to be, again, on your unit circle, one is the sine of half, so sine goes up, one, two, three, so sine of half is the half. And where all I have to do is C. I feel like they set you up for a trip with like that arc sign at one point. So I'm like, oh, my first time on arc sign, so like, you're solving for sine, but sine inverse of one half is a unit circle. Anybody at number three? I feel like number two is great. I don't think I'm getting part of it, but it is. So, like at the very end, you get your half. Well, I just had it. I got it. And I helped a lot of you on it yesterday. So essentially, what happens is on the calculator, you had two curves. You had your y equals 3 curve, and you had your inverse tan curve. So, what you were supposed to do or see is that cross sections perpendicular to this curve were going to be squares. So, the length of the square. S was going to be the top curve 3 minus the bottom curve and inverse X. So then you're just evaluating that square to get your volume. So your volume was equal to 0 to 1 of 3 minus and inverse X squared. And now at that point, it's just a calculator question. And it was finally something other than C that are being done. Okay. Jumping over to particle motion. So, particle motion was lesson 7 dash. One. So that was the beginning of chapter seven. So that's why I added the particle motion back to our review. So we briefly kind of looked at some examples from this, but we want to go back and make sure we truly have a good idea and understanding of particle motion. So you can see as I'm like scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, every and all you know, there are tons of pre response questions. Because in years past, there has 
always been a guaranteed area in volume, and there was always a guaranteed rate in and rate out. I can't remember what year it was, but there was a year in which there was not an area in volume, and we as speakers were like, what? We like guarantee our kids those two free responses. My thought is that it's, there's going to be one this year, because I think with COVID, they kind of pushed away, and so I think 2021 was the year it didn't happen. I think it's coming down. There is typically a particle motion or a dippy Q question as well. If the particle motion question is not a free response, there are guaranteed multiple choice particle motions. So particle motion, the key ideas on this handout is really understanding what words mean. So what does it mean if it's initially? Initially means time equals zero. Origin means x of t equals zero. At rest means velocity is zero. If velocity is positive, then you think right or forward. If velocity is negative, then you think left or backwards. And then um, speed is that absolute value. So speed also takes into account velocity and acceleration. So if you're told the speed is increasing, then you know velocity and acceleration are the same sign. And that's kind of what some of these questions on here get at. So in the past, we would compare velocity and acceleration to say that it was increasing. Well, now that we can take problems forwards and backwards, if they would put in the problem that the speed is increasing and your told velocity is positive, then you have to assume acceleration. So now you're at a point where you can start to make assumptions. So if you're given information about speed, you can make assumptions. We also talked about neck change, and we talked about displacement. So displacement is where you end up. Displacement is where you end up. Net change is your position. So that change is your position. So if I start here and I take five steps forward and three steps back, that would give me my position. The displacement would simply be the distance from the beginning to the end. If particle is moving along the x-axis, the velocity is given by the following equation. If the particle is at position x equals 2, so this is what threw um, some of you off yesterday, because it gave you x equals 2, um, but that was really you kind of like the y value, because t is time and t is like our x value in this case. X of zero is thus equal to two. So now, if I want to know what is the position of the particle at time t equals one, that's like saying X of one equals X of zero plus the integral from zero to one of v of t dt. So then I replace x of 0 with 2, and I anti-derive my velocity. So I become 3t cubed over 3, which would be t cubed, plus 6t squared over 2, which would become 3t squared, evaluating from 1 to 0. And then you plug in for 1, so you get 1 plus 3, which is 4, 2 plus 4 is 6, which is answer choice.
If particle travels in a straight line with a glass acceleration of three meters per second, blah, 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 blah. This one is a little bit different because now you have to take into account distance. So what you need to do for this problem is say distance equals the integral from zero to two of absolute value of v of t dt. And you got 14. The antiderivative of acceleration. So if they gave you acceleration, which is um, if the velocity of the particle is 10 meters per second at 10 t equals 2. And then um, with a constant acceleration of 3. So that's like saying, because it says constant acceleration, this is a velocity point, but we know the acceleration is 3. So velocity equals the integral of acceleration. So the antiderivative of acceleration would be 3p plus c. And then you could have used your velocity point to solve for c. So you would have said 10 equals c. I don't have seen this before. The position of a particle at 10 t is given by length, then the average velocity, and again, if Kathy was here yesterday, that when we were talking about this, we remembered that average was 1 over v minus a. Um, so in this case, though, because you're given position, and you want average velocity, we're actually taking x of minus x of over the x. You are actually integrating this problem. So if you look at the problem, if you're going from position to velocity, you're finding the slope. You're going from velocity or acceleration backwards to the So it says blah blah blah, I try p is given by blank, and the average velocity is y. So then you wanted to take negative 5 3 squared by 0 over 3. So you had negative 5 times 9.
Okay, the answer for this one was also C. Uh, and that had to do with that at zero velocity, it was increasing at one, it was, or it was decreasing at one, it was increasing, and at three, you had a horizontal. And then five was pretty much all calculator. So if they gave you velocity and you want to know acceleration, then that's back eight. So you're going to have a derivative. So A of T was equal to B prime of 4, so you should have done math 8 on your calculator, plugged in that equation, plugged in that 4, and you got C. Thank you. 